Well, welcome back. Season two, episode three of the Powered Up Coaches Show, brought to you, of course, by Sideline Power, your one stop shop for all of your coaching technology needs. Well, this is a fun one, folks. Buckle in. You're going to have a great time with Gretna East head coach Justin Haberman. So many things to take from this episode. We're going to start with how do you start a football program, a high school football program from scratch? He's going to tell us how as he's in year two at Gretna East. Also, how he has dealt with adversity in his life and how those lessons of adversity has made him a better football coach. And you're going to learn about the really poignant story of coaching his two sons in a state championship game in 2020. You're going to hear all that and more on this episode of the Powered Up Coaches Show. Well, this is an absolute pleasure because it's not often that I get to sit across from a football coach who actually got thrown out of a soccer game because of too many red cards. <laughs> and we're going to get into that story later, All Coach. Right. But uh, listen, let's start, uh, as we like to do on this show, back in your hometown, which is a little town called Beaumont, California, yes. in Southern California. And by the way, Beaumont, I learned, stands for a beautiful mountain because it's yes. in the foothills, right? Absolutely. Of uh, what? Mount San Jacinto Mountains? Mount San Jacinto. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes, so yes. what was that like? That sounds like a beautiful place to grow up. Uh, you know, I, I tell people all the time, I was truly blessed. Uh, I, I lived in the foothills above Palm Springs, California. Um, so we had the desert just 15, 20 minutes away. Uh, we had the beach 45 minutes away. And we had Big Bear Mountain where all the skiing was 45 to a minute, you know, to an hour up the mountain. So there was many times uh, we'd have people laugh at us. We would wake up in the morning. And we'd go snowboard in the in the morning, and then we would surf in the afternoon. That is unbelievable. When you think about that, yes. and you think of Nebraska, we're a long ways from any of those things. Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> what a way to grow up. Now, look, you were a ferocious linebacker in high school, college. Um, I got to imagine people were afraid to take you on in those uh, Sandlot football games. What were those like? Uh, you know, truly blessed. You know, I've, I, I've had great opportunity. You know, growing up in Beaumont was a very blue collar town. My parents were very blue collar. You know, when I say I was out snowboarding and and, and, and surfing, it wasn't because we had the money. I had friends that had that had the toys, and I just got to tag along. But uh, very blue collar, and I was raised that way, and, and that's how I played football. I played football like a blue collar football player, smash mouth, get after it, um, and uh, I just wanted to honor the game and play it the way that the people before me played. And I, I, I honor, you know, I, I'd respect people like Dick Budkiss and, and, you know, those junior sales of the world that, that played the game mean and tough and physical. And then I tried to emulate that. Yeah. Well, listen, coach Arberman, you're a, a young guy to be quoting Butkus and guys <laughs> like that. That's, that's uh, yes. a guy I know, but I love hearing that because man, he was tough and it all starts right. When you're a kid, it's, it seems for a lot of people now, Beaumont was not necessarily a tiny town, a couple hundred thousand. It is now. Okay. Uh, back when I was there, back in, in the 90s, early 90s, it was about 6,000 to 7,000 people. Unbelievable. Now now you're in the in the upper one, you know, 110, 120. Uh, that's how quick the town's changed. You know, my parents are still there. And they they said we went from knowing everybody to not knowing anybody. Mm -hmm. And it's all that growth with the uh, house market crash and the out on the beaches and everybody moving inland and – so that, that town's changed a lot. So it's not my little hometown that I knew and loved. You know, th the thing is, uh, you've got, I mean, you talk about eclectic with the mountains and the beach. So what was, what was a summer day like? You're out of school. Yep. You're 12 years old. What's a, what's a summer day like in Beaumont for you? Well, when I was that, day? when I was 12, it was uh, get, get up, go and go ride our bikes. Uh, we were huge into BMX racing. I, I rode all over Southern California, racing bicycles growing up. And um, I had a, a, a kid across the street his mom ran us all over southern california racing bicycles we ended up going out and r racing in oklahoma city and down in texas and arizona and and uh it was fun you know uh, and then we played and we'd, we'd meet up at the park and tackle football until somebody got hurt and we'd have enough to play and <laughs> uh and, and basketball parks and stuff like that it was it was a fun blue collar hard-working town that just loved athletics yeah well i'll tell you you you, you talk about learning balance and then also uh, checking the heart meter here. When you're doing BMX, you're hitting some big. You're going over Absolutely. some big hills, aren't you? Absolutely. I mean, we, we're. I, <laughs> I love bikes. Um, 
even still this day, I, ha I have a 10 speed. Um, you'll love this. I did ride the Rockies a few years back and I'm a big guy. I get it. Um, my average speed up the mountain was three miles an hour. My average speed down the mile mountain was 72 miles an hour <laughs> on a 10 speed. Um, so it's fun. I, I love yeah. that. I love that, that get after it. And, and we grew up and that's, that was our form of transportation until we were able to drive as we rode our bikes all over Southern California and the towns changed by the dotted lines in the road. So you'd ride to one town and then ride the next town and ride the next town because they were all so close. Um, now Beaumont had some gap in between, but we didn't care. We just would ride our bikes everywhere. Yeah. And I, I'll tell people, I, I believe that's what made me as fast as I was. You know, I was an extremely fast linebacker. Um, and, uh, you know, at 250 pounds, I, you know, I ran a, a four, five, three, forty. Mm. Um, but riding that bicycle my whole life helped me develop that strength of the legs and the power and rut roll pedaling up the hills and down the hills. And so that, I, I, tr I truly believe that helped me. Yeah. You know, and, and you are a believer, you were a multi-sport guy. Yeah. Uh, for those kids out there today who are specializing, right? Yep. I have a feeling you'd have some advice because I just saw a piece yeah. on ESPN the other day about how lacrosse, they have the best athletes, right, yeah. at anything. And it really teaches some skills that, that are very transferable to other sports. What would be your advice to that kid who says, I'm playing one sport, that's it? It's a mistake. It's, it's that he, college coaches don't come into me and say, hey, coach, I want the best high school football player you have. They say, coach, we want the best athletes. Every college football coach thinks that they could coach better than the high school coaches. And, and they want to find the best athletes to put into their program. And if you specialize... Uh, you see so much injury out in those kids. Over, I've been doing this for 22 years now. Mm -hmm. You see kids get injured that try to do it year-round. That's not what's best for them. The body's built to do different things. Um, as a head football coach at Gretna East, I tell my kids, I want you to be multi-sport athletes. I want you on the wrestling mat. I want you on the basketball court. I want you on the baseball field. Uh, I'll tell you, baseball's tough, though. That, that's a sport that they start playing in February, and they don't end until August yeah. uh, because of Legion Ball. Uh, here, here in the state of Nebraska. Um, but that's a lot of time. But I want those kids out being multi-sport athletes. You know, we go at 6, six o'clock in the morning uh, for our, our summer strength and conditioning just so they can be done by 8. So they could go do Legion baseball in the afternoon and not affect them. You know, make sure they get the proper nutrition and hydration and stuff like that. But it's so important. I had you know, my oldest son, Cade, and my, my middle son, Cole, were both um, – multi-sport athletes. Cade was the first 12-time letter award winner in Westside history. Um, he did uh, football, wrestling, and track. And then my other son, Cole, was football and wrestling. And my daughter was a three-sport athlete at Westside. It's so important to have a well-rounded base and understanding. Yeah, and, and listen, you had a son, too. I'm trying to think if it's Cole or Cade, two runner-up uh, at, at wrestling championships or just about got to the pinnacle, but yes. man, two runner ups. So both my boys are two time runner ups. Uh, there we so, go. Yeah. So Cade, um, Cade was a runner up as a sophomore to junior. I uh, was the number one wrestler his senior year and made a, uh, bad mistake and, and, and around came back and ended up third. Um, and he'd beat both the young men, uh, multiple times earlier in the season, but that's the way the cookie crumbles. And then, uh, my other son, Cole, uh, wrestled Vincent Genitone, uh, his junior and senior year, both for the state title. And and uh, I still, to this day, have people come up and say, that's the most electric wrestling match I've ever seen. <laughs> Those two young men tossed each other around the mat. And and they great athletes. You know, you, you get to watch these kids develop and, and their strength and speed and all that from the football field to the wrestling mat is just unreal. You know, we talk a lot about track and football coaches. Let's be honest. And I know you've coached some track. They love track athletes, but Ben Stilley, kid yes. down the road here from Ashland Greenwood right now with the Arizona Cardinals. He was a great wrestler. Yes, he was. Sometimes I think wrestling gets overlooked for a sport that is great for football. Why is it? Yeah, you know, I, I, I don't know. It's kind of funny though. It's, I have college coaches come to me and, and rather they ask one or two things. Are they wrestlers and they love it? Or they want basketball players because they want the feet work. Uh -huh. well, is it different for linemen versus skill? It is. Okay. They love the defensive linemen to be wrestlers. They love the offensive linemen to be basketball players. I don't, I don't know why that is. Um, I, I will tell you, uh, the, the understanding leverage, mm -hmm. I think, is what is such an important fact of wrestling. You get wrestling in there. You get them to understand that leverage for defensive linemen. Um, is just so valuable. And wrestlers have tremendous feet work too. If you don't have great feet work, then you're not a very good wrestler. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so it, they're, they're, I think both sports are great. You know, I, I'm lucky enough this year at Gretna East to have a couple basketball players. I just had a 6'6 six, six, uh, basketball player walk out and say, hey, coach, I want to try football. Mm. Oh, great. I'll take a 6'6 six, six athlete any day of the week. You know, what <laughs> He I mean? walked in, got his pads and helmet right away. Yeah, I did. I got him the next day. I had him pads and helmet for him. So. Yeah, love it. Love yeah. it. You're not going to turn that down. Now, listen, we got a little bit away from growing up. Yes. There's a couple more things I want to do Absolutely. but or, or go over, but you're a Raiders fan. A Raiders fan. What die hard. Your, you've got great parents. What yes. did they think about their son wanting to be a Raiders fan? My dad's a diehard Raider fan. <laughs> <laughs> so he loved yes. it. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, growing up in the 80s, that's, oh, that's they yeah. were the LA Raiders. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I always thought it was funny. My dad had a hat. He always wore, and I always like dad. I wanted, dad, it says Oakland Raiders. Why? You know, like, I get there from Oakland, but dad, they're LA now, you know? <laughs> and uh, he kept it. And, and my dad still to this day has Las Vegas Raider hat now. Uh, but it it was a family thing. I, I loved uh, the meanness. I loved Howie Long. You know, I yeah. love Lila Alzado. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the meanness, the just win, baby. I tell yes. my kids, just, just win, Al Davis. It doesn't get any better <laughs> than that, you know. Just win, the attitude, the swagger those, those guys played with, the, the meanness, the, the bow. I mean, there's not a better running back, in my opinion, ever that played the game than Bo Jackson. Mm -hmm. If You know, an injury slowed, slowed his career and ended it. But, boy, what an amazing guy. Marcus Allen. You know, you had, you know, we talked about here in Nebraska, they had the Weebacks, you know. Boy, that, the Weebacks in the NFL were Marcus Allen and Bo Jackson, you That's know. That's right. Uh, just special, special uh, guys. So yeah. I, I love those guys. Well, I love the name Lyle Alzado. I hadn't heard him in a long time. Yes. Man, he was gritty and tough. You know, you talked about your parents uh, before the interview. You sent me some information. Your dad taught you work ethic. Yes. And you mentioned blue collar. I want to know what that looked like, though. When you say he taught me work ethic, what did you see? Uh, uh, you know, my dad came from my, my dad's dad was military. My dad was military. My oldest brother's military. My nephews are military. I was the only one that didn't go military. Um, coming out of high school, my dad, I was going to go to the military. My dad said, son, I serve so you could go to college. And he pushed me to go the college football route. Um, what it was was I grew up with yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Look a person in the eye, shake their hand. Um, your word was worth everything. And that's what it was. Um, I, I was never afraid of work. To this day, I'm not afraid of work. Um, you get after it and you do what you say you're going to do. And you treat everybody with respect. Um, no matter who they are, what they are, where they come from. You know, who their parents are, who their parents aren't. You treat everybody with respect. And you get after it. You do your best every single day. Well, I know your mom was a peach, too. We're going to talk about her later. But when you tell me that your father said, I did this, I, I served so that you can go to college. I mean, it's that part of parenting, right, where you put someone way above yourself. And it sounds yeah. like he emulated that as well. You know, and when I sent you some stuff and talked about mentors and mm -hmm. uh, my coaching career, my biggest mentor is my father. Mm -hmm. um, without getting choked up, but, you know, I, I, I every day I wake up and try to be the best human I can be to honor my father's last name. Mm -hmm. You know, those, those to, to me are the things that are important, uh, that every day I know that I've done everything I can to honor my father. Yeah. And that, that's, what's big to me. Uh, my dad's been a, so meaningful in my life and everything I do. I, and, and I said that to him the other day and he said, son, you don't ever have to worry about that. You've done that. Mm -hmm. But to me, that's what I work for. I work to honor my parents. Mm -hmm. so. Incredible legacy. Incredible yeah. legacy. Now, one of the other things I know you learned that toughness too from your parents. And boy, did you have to be tough because you have this great high school career. You go on to college, college of the desert. Yep. And all of a sudden these shoulder injuries that you wouldn't take any time off for, no, right? You I knew you not. got hurt in high school. Yep. You wouldn't take any time off. So you go to college and unfortunately shoulder pops out. So yeah. how did you... First time really dealing with adversity. Yep. How it, did that teach you how to get through adversity or was it a very low point in your life and you struggled through that? You know, it, it, adversity, I, I didn't have any in high school until my senior year. And it was, we were winning the uh, Dan's League uh, Championship. Uh, we were up big. Uh, they subbed me out. Uh, the linebacker got hurt. They put me back in while they were trying to find somebody else. I, I could go and pop back out. And um, the quarterback runs to the sideline. And me not being smart, the kid cut back and I reached to grab him and dislocated my shoulder. And um, 
you know, the next week I, I played on it and dislocated a few times and played on it, dislocated a few times, went to basketball, dislocated a few times and all track season, you know, being, I was an anchor for the four, four by one relay team, uh, ran the open hundred. I was shot in disc and every time I throw the disc, the shoulder would dis dislocate. And so I knew it wasn't good. Uh, had a chance to go to San Diego state to play, yeah. play high school fo or college football. Couldn't pass a physical back then. We had to take a physical. I couldn't pass it. They revoked the scholarship. I ended up at College of the Desert. I was there three days. And I'll never forget one of the selling points at College of the Desert. Like I said, very blue-collar family. And um, it was a, a financial thing. Like, I'm going to have to go down here. And I went down, played three days of football, dislocated my shoulder, tore everything connecting mm. the shoulder and chest, and and uh, had to have sh shoulder surgery. And, and at that point, I'm like, uh, I've never had an injury. Uh, can I bounce back from this? And uh, the coaches, uh, Coach Reed Benjamin was my linebacker coach, and uh, Coach Dossel, the head coach out there, were just amazing. And uh, Coach Benjamin was there every day. It was funny. He was there after surgery was over, and I got back after it. And, and, and that's where that work ethic that my father taught me it came in. Nothing could slow me down. Uh, I started with an empty milk jug and, and trying to get it to, to work. And now the bad part is I can't get my hand over lifting, my head right? now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it, there's so much arthritis in this shoulder. It needs to be replaced now, but I'm too young and I'm like not doing it. Uh, but, uh, that's, that's, that's where that work ethic, my father came in and I didn't slow down and I came back from that. And then I ended up crushing my lower back bench pressing mm. 425 and, and, and crushed L4 and L5 and had to have back surgery. And, uh, I thought, boy, maybe I need to be done. And, and nope, my father, my mother, my coaches just kept encouraging me and, Came back and had two two tremendous seasons mm -hmm. uh, at College of the Desert. Right. And then you end up, and, and that says something, and, and boy, I hope some of your players watch this because when they hear that and just that perseverance, right, it's Absolutely. something that they can take with them as well. Any player can. But you end up, after that run, at Dana College in Blair, Nebraska. First yeah. off, how did you find Dana College from College of the Desert? Well, <laughs> kind of embarrassing uh, story here, <laughs> but but I'll share it with you. Um I had bigger offers to go bigger places mm -hmm. and um, not knowing I didn't know any better. I had signed and I did not go to class a spring semester like I should have. Mm -hmm. Like I should have. Uh, I worked at the largest sports bar in Southern California, uh, bouncing and bartending and, and had a lot of fun and made some mistakes and didn't go to class. And I became academically ineligible. Um, but I was making a lot of money. <laughs> at, <laughs> you think at, you yeah. think at the time, right, that right. it's a lot of money. And it, it really wasn't looking back now. It ain't like I could have raised a family on it or anything. Right. But um, uh, I, I end up had to find a smaller school to go to, Division Two or smaller. And um, there was, I didn't know if I wanted to continue playing. And Coach Benjamin and my parents set me down. And my dad said, "Son, what's what's your path in life? What are you gonna do? Are you gonna, are you gonna bartend the rest of your life? Are you gonna bounce the rest of your life?" Or do you want to get a degree? And then and then I, I remember reflecting, saying, my dad told me he served so I could go to college. Mm -hmm. And it made me really think and, and go, okay, I need to do this. And so uh, I told my coach, I said, Coach Benjamin, find anybody that's looking for a linebacker, let's find me somewhere to go. And I got a uh, – within a few phone calls, I got an offer from Union, Kentucky, uh, Union College in Kentucky, uh, Liberty in West Virginia – um, Adam State in Colorado, I believe it was, mm -hmm. Midland College in Fremont, Nebraska, and Dana College in Blair, Nebraska. And uh, I came home and my mom said, hey, this Coach Krieger from Dana College called. I really like him. You might want to call him back. <laughs> Already she's endorsing it. She yeah. is. And so she uh, got me and, you know, I started talking to these coaches and I was a little, little frustrated that I was going somewhere lower than I thought I should be. And, um, and I said, whoever gets me the scholarship first is where I'm going to end up going. The next day, Dana College had a scholarship FedEx to me, and mm. and I signed, sealed, and delivered. And uh, the best part about this story is I never even seen the campus. Sight unseen. Sight well, unseen. So Coach Krieger had to be a pretty good salesperson on uh, the phone. Well, it was that, he, your mom's on board too. Yeah. So Coach Krieger did a great job, and Coach Craig Stern, that's now up at um, Saint Olaf, mm -hmm. is a defensive Minnesota. court. Yep. Yeah. Uh, he's up there. Um, he sold me. I, he, he, we're one linebacker away from winning a national championship. And, and I, to this day, I, I, I tease him. He says, no, I did it. I could, I, I didn't want to go anywhere that wasn't a winning. I've never, I was never a part of a non-winning program. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to go to a winning program. 
And I could have swore he told me it was seven and three the year before, but it wasn't. It was three and seven. <laughs> so I, I'm not saying he lied to me, or, but he said, no, I told you we were three and seven. But how'd that run go, that two year run with, with the wins and losses? Uh, you know what? We, we were you one linebacker away? Oh, uh, we, we were pretty dang good. I yeah. a special player, a special friend, um, uh, Biff Schofield, yes. an Ashton Greenwood yeah, absolutely. kid, uh, was my strong safety. Uh, I was strong side linebacker. We we had that side locked down. Um, it, we had a great defensive line with Lance Sorensen out of Blair and Brett Erickson out of Blair and and Dave Roller out of uh, Omaha, one of the Omaha schools. And we had a really good defense and mm-hmm. and, and and a lot of talent. And and Coach Krieger tried his best. We were we were you know four or five win team. Um, we weren't quite one linebacker away. <laughs> um, we had a, a tremendous running back that had no business being at Dana College by the name of Chevis Lamoya. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was just a lights out kid. Um, we had Jason Megason out of uh, over across the river. Um, Castle Bluffs. Uh, uh, Atlanta. Not Atlantic, oh, Atlant- um, Atlantic? No, damn, I can't believe it. Uh, <laughs> I, we're starts like on a game G. show here. Yeah. What is it? Yes, uh, it starts with a G. Um, Glenwood. <laughs> Glenwood. Glenwood. Right, Geez, I can't believe I forgot Glenwood. <laughs> and then, uh, so we had a lot of talent. And, and you know, the, the coaches worked hard. Coach Krieger was a great guy. Um, you know, I learned learned a lot from him. He was a tremendous linebacker when he played there. Uh, and, and then he, he's the one that gave me my first break in college. I had two tremendous seasons at Dana. Played with the Omaha B for a couple of years. Yeah. Um, you know, had a lot of honors when I was at Dana. Um, that, that Coach Krieger really worked, but uh, Coach Krieger came to me right after I got done playing and said, hey, I need a linebacker coach. And I thought, wow, I just got done playing for you like a week ago. <laughs> but he hired me as the inside linebacker coach, and that's how I got into coaching. And three years there, we're going we're gonna to come and pick that back up. But I want to I wanna just retreat back to your mother here. Yes. Because she liked Dana. She did. But the piece of advice she gave you was, now listen, don't go to Nebraska meet the love of your life and never come back to California. And boy, that happened, didn't it? It did. Uh, literally. And then I, we were at, uh, Ontario airport in, in Ontario, California. And my mom gave me a hug. And the last thing she said is that before I got on the tarmac is don't meet some nice girl and get married and stay there. <laughs> well, guess what? I'm still here. So, <laughs> yes. Go ahead. I'm suing it. Dana, yes. right? Uh, yeah. No, it's, it was actually Lance Sorensen's, uh, the, the defensive end sister. Uh, okay. Um, I looked down the sideline and, I'm a little different now, but I had a big bleach blonde mohawk. And <laughs> and uh, I said, hey, who's a pretty blonde taking pictures? And uh, and he just happened to be standing next to me. He's like, that's my sister. She doesn't like your type. And I said, doesn't <laughs> like my type? What? what? He goes, she doesn't like mohawks and tattoos. And <laughs> I met her two days later. We, we, we were dating ever since. So I love it. Yes. I love it. That is a great story. I, and, you know, any D lineman is going to tell his buddy D lineman, uh-uh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, exactly. And I still, t- to this day, I tease him. I said, I told you your sister like like this type. <laughs> <laughs> it has certainly worked out. Three yes. amazing kids. We're going to come back to that as well. But first, so you, you get in to Dan as an assistant yes. coach. But before that, I think, you play football for the Beef, Omaha Beef. Yes, sir. Yep. And the, the, the biggest question is, I want to know is why. What? Because, again, I know you guys aren't getting rich. Yeah. Uh, it is a, it's tough, but it's got to be, there's got to be a pull there. Was it just the love of football or was there something else? You know, I got done playing. Uh, I'd asked my, I've asked my wife, Amy, to marry me uh, my senior year of college. Um, we got married. I finished up playing. And then um, little did we know, um, I had the Canadian Football League came. I had a few NFL scouts come see us, just a few, and um, had a chance to possibly go up uh, myself and a, and a gentleman by the name of Mark Bolrichter from Hastings. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had a chance to go up to Canada, uh, so they came down and talked to us. We had I could have gone up to the Organauts and tried out up there, mm-hmm. and a couple other teams had opportunities, and, and I found out my wife was pregnant with my son, Cade. And uh, she said, you go up there and – and you know, and when when it's time you come home, and the and, and I said no, I'm not leaving you, and and so I got a hold of a few people that I had had contact with, and I said, hey, if I played arena ball, is there a chance I could still make it to where the pinnacle of football? And you know, that's when you're young and and not, you don't quite know as well. Uh, and I, I so I ended up um, trying out for the Omaha Beef. There was 480 people that tried out that first year, um, and there was just a ton of of people trying out and. And I, so I kept everything you'd get on the computer and you'd check, check, see if you made the cut for the next week. And, 
And we got down to like the final, I think it was like the final 40 people. And I I just had a tremendous practice and coach Murtaugh um, was the linebacker. Jerry Murtaugh was mm-hmm. the linebacker coach. And, and he came up, Oh my gosh, Haberman, what a great practice. I, I can't wait to see you next practice. You know, you are definitely one of my guys. I said, okay, great. You know, this is amazing. And, uh, I go home and the next day the cuts come out I look and I'm not on the list. The final, the final 30 guys on the roster and I'm, I'm not on it. And I thought, wow, well, coach Murtaugh said he really liked me and I was going to be one of his guys. Well, kind of bummed out, heartbroken, didn't make it. It's what it is, what it is. And so we're supposed to have practice that night and I don't go. I, I didn't make the, the, the roster. I get a phone call about 7.30 and Coach Murtaugh, Hoverman, why were you in practice? I said, Coach, I wasn't on the list. He goes, that was a mistake. You should have been here. Get to practice. <laughs> and so I flew down into Omaha and I got there like last 20 minutes of practice and I was I made the roster. So, so did he override someone or was there a mistake? You know, according to Coach Buddha, Coach Buddha yeah. talked to me. He yeah. said it was truly a mistake that yeah. I should have been on the list and, and it was just... Just a mistake, but there was one young man that went to practice that night that didn't come back anymore either. So, <laughs> yeah, he got bumped out. All right, yes. I've got to know this. First off, you throw out Coach Buddha. Yes, Coach Murtaugh. I got to hear a Coach Murtaugh story. That guy is a legend. His show on the radio yes. is just absolutely hilarious. Give me one Murtaugh story. Well, I'll tell you, Coach Murtaugh is intense. Yeah. He is an intense guy. And not being from Nebraska, I didn't know who this guy was. I didn't know he was a legendary linebacker from the University of Nebraska. And he was intense. And, and you know, there'd be times that he'd, he'd miss practice because he's out working on the, on the train. And, and then, uh, but I'll tell you, he was just a great, great man. Mm-hmm. And I really appreciate working with him just because he, he'd come up and give you tips and tricks. But it was more about the relationship that he built with you. And, and he'd give you tips and tricks and help you be a better linebacker. But he also cared about your family. He cared about who you're doing, where you're working, what, where your fu- future is going. He was just a really, really great person to work with. Well, and what he's done with that foundation to yes. help former Huskers out. Not at all surprised to hear you say that. So so you get this. All right, so was coaching accidental? Was it accidental because, you know, coach reached out and says, hey, join my staff? Or did you think you were going that direction? I was going to go that direction either way. If it was at Dana College, anywhere else. You know, the the bad part is college football coaching doesn't get paid a lot unless you're in the big-time spotlight. You know, unless you're at the big-time programs. You know, that's people don't realize that. Oh, these college coaches, well, these college coaches are working their tail off for not a lot of money. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. um, you know, people don't understand the hours that go, go into college coaching. You know, it is – a lot of people doing a lot of hard work so those kids can be on the field getting opportunities to get degrees and, and stuff like that. Uh, but I just wanted to give back to to a, a, the football community that gave so much to me in life. So I knew I'd go that path some way. Um, where it was, where the start was going to be, truly blessed that Jim Krieger uh, thought highly enough of, of me as a player to give me an opportunity to coach. Uh, Rondell Korblick was the D.C. at the time. He believed enough in me to hire me. What did they see, do you think? What do you think they saw? I I think it comes back to that work ethic. Mm -hmm. I wasn't afraid. I was a kid that was in the film room nonstop. I was a kid that learned from my mistakes of getting myself in academic trouble and not going to play to uh, I was on the dean's list every semester. It also helps having a beautiful wife or girlfriend at the time going, no, you're getting a degree. (laughs) But, uh, you know, I I think they seen that work ethic and knew that I wasn't afraid to to spend the time. I did it as a player. I was in there watching film all day long, breaking stuff down. I'd go to them, hey, coach, did you see this or did you see that? Or, hey, did you see that when they they shift from here to this, they're running this play? And they saw, I believe they saw those things. And and all, it was really, it was, Dana College was a rough place to coach because the pay wasn't great for anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so, you know, when that staff, that defensive staff moved on, some of them went to Midland. They invited me to go with them to Midland. I turned it down because I was staying and finishing my degree. Um, and, and then I worked with a new staff and, and, and the, the turnover is so big at those lower level schools. Um, you know, the head coaches are around for a long time cause they get paid. Okay. But those, 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 those other coaches don't. And so you learn a lot from everybody. Uh, I, there are some tremendous coaches that went through there. Uh, I mean, coach Wright down at Northwest Missouri state was an Anna college uh, coach. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's some great coaches that are just trying to build their way and use those as stepping stones. So. Well, you talk about great coaches. One of them, one of your great mentors, of course, was uh, Brett Frank um, at, at Omaha Westside. Tell me why you gravitated 
to him. You know, it, it was really a, a neat story. Um, and by uh, the way, let me let me just tell everyone, of course, from from Dana, you go to Westside. You yes. get hired as an assistant by Coach Frank. So why yep. why why was he a mentor? Why did you gravitate? Well, it was kind of funny. There was a, a, a distance runner at Dana College, and I was coaching college football. Bill Dan and Howard just took over as the head football coach at, at, at Dana. Um, Bill wanted to move me from the linebacker coach to running backs to be on the on the offensive side of the ball with him. And uh, this distance coach called me up and said, hey, uh, Westside needs a throwing coach. Uh, and and, and I, I know you helped at, at Dana with the throwers. Would you be interested? So I just happened to get into Westside being a throw coach. Mm -hmm. And um, Fred Hutchinson, a longtime uh, Big 8, Big 10 official, uh, was a teacher there, was a freshman football coach and the head track coach. I coached under him for one year as a, as a throw coach. He goes, Coach, I need you coaching football here. Why do you think that was? Uh, you know what? I, I I give my probably too much, yeah. you know, to for what we got paid. I just was dedicated to my craft. You know, I try to make kids great. I try to build relationships. Uh, I try to do the things that are going to make kids great. Uh, so I just worked my tail off for him. And so uh, he, at the time, Marty Kaufman was the head coach, and he connected me with Marty. And, and Marty said, boy, I'd love to have you on my staff. And I worked uh, half the summer with him. And he said, you know, Coach, I know you have a young family. I would love to keep you on the varsity staff. I don't have a paid position there, um, but I do have a paid freshman position. He goes, if you stay on the varsity staff, as soon as I can get you paid, I will. Or you could go down and, and um, you know, and get a paid freshman job. And uh, at the time, Fred Hutchinson was the freshman coach. And I'm like, great, I'll work with Fred. And then as a young a young father, I'm like, I need all the money we could get. And so I, I did. So I took the uh, took the freshman job. I spent two years down there as a defensive coordinator. Three years, excuse me, three years as a defensive coordinator. And uh, Coach Freund was the, d the defensive coordinator at Westside at the time. Um, coach Kaufman elevated me to the JV staff the next year. Then the next year, he elevated me to the varsity running back, outside linebackers coach. And uh, I did that for one year. And then Brett Freund took over as head coach after Marty retired. Yeah. Um, what were those attributes, you think, of coach that, that made you gravitate and say, boy, this is a guy that I re really want to follow? You, you see somebody that uh, wants to know the game. Mm -hmm. Coach Freund always wanted to go and know every aspect of the game and never – uh, would shy away from the the long hours of the work or the film breakdown or the study. Um, I'll tell you, I thought I was a good coach coaching college football. I thought I really was. I worked with some tremendous kids. Uh, but when I started working with Coach Freund, I saw a whole different part of the game I didn't know. You know, the, the statistic side of it all. Mm -hmm. You know, I was a big smash mouth, you know, let's let's play football, get after it. And I didn't really see that aspect of the game. And I seen him doing that. I went, oh. Wow. And I learned that and I started watching him. And so I, I gravitated towards him and on that staff, you know, on the staff and, and learned as much as I could from him. And that helped elevate me through that freshman year, JV year. I was that guy, the freshman coach that would go and sit in the, in the film room and help break down film and, and, you know, just watch and listen to everything they said and, and kept my mouth quiet and just kept working. And so I gravitated from that that way. Yeah, and then you've got another great mentor on the same staff, Coach McKeever, who was the yes. track coach, I understand, but Absolutely. also DB coach yes. at West Side. Again, what were the things that he did that – why did he become a mentor? I'll tell you, he is probably one of the greatest men I know. A tremendous father, tremendous husband, uh, a, a, a great Christian man. Uh, and I saw that and I wanted to, you know, I just thought I got into fellowship of Christian athletes when I was at Westside and, and got that going at Westside because I, I seen the need for it within the school. Mm -hmm. But I had great men like him and uh, assistant principal Tony Weirs, and we would meet as a men's group and, 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 and do some some uh, Bible studies and, and book readings and stuff. And, and he was just such a great man that I wanted to beat like him and and the best part is i think he was arguably one of the best coaches on the on the staff and in the state his dbs were so well coached and and just learned from him so i just really looked up to, to coach mckeever yeah well you had some great mentors um and for 21 years you're at west side the last several co-head defensive coordinator yes um i love you defensive coaches you guys have got 
there's just a toughness to you. But uh, <laughs> but you once said to be a good D coordinator, mm-hmm. you have got to know as much about offense as you do defense. Absolutely. And there are so many young D coordinators out there that might not take that. They, they you know, I've got to perfect the defensive side of it. Yeah. But what would you say to them if they're not paying as much attention to the offense as they are the D? <laughs> you're you're gonna you're not gonna be as good as you think you are. Yeah, you are. To me, I spend more time when I go to clinics. Uh, I try my best to get into the offensive sessions. I want to know what they're doing to attack me. I know the defensive side. If if you're a good D coordinator, you know what 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 you want to do. Mm-hmm. How are they going to attack you? So I go in and, and I. Myself and Craig Sakura, a great friend of mine, Westside's offensive coordinator, we office together next to each other for 16 years. We would laugh. It was whoever had the pin last was going to win. <laughs> and we would sit there and, and we would draw up plays and talk. And, and he'd say, I'd attack you this way. I'll attack you that way. And we'll all do this. I'll do that. And, and you just learn so much from listening to the other side of the ball and how they would attack you and the things they want to do. Uh, I think it's so beneficial to young defensive coaches that you – know what's happening on the other side of the ball you know your craft you're pretty you're pr- probably pretty good at it but you need to know the other side even better mm. well listen you've also been as a 21 year assistant coach i'm curious how that is for you now as a head coach do you are you a more understanding boss as a head coach with your assistant are you more demanding uh, what wh- how has that shaped you as a head coach with your in regards specifically to your assistants um you know, I, I want to first by saying I think I have some of the best assistant coaches in the state. Uh, I just had a conversation with somebody uh, earlier today. I wouldn't say that unless I truthfully thought that. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say I have the – I do. I have some great coaches that have came from great programs. Um, I have guys that, that should probably be coaching it, at, you know, being OCs, DCs, and for other programs, but they're assistant coaches for me mm-hmm. um, just because they're great men. Um, when I go out and hire a, a great coach or go out and find a, a, a replacement coach, my first thing I look for is being a great man. If you're going to lead the young men of Gretna East, you need to be a great human. You need to be a great guy. So that's what I look after. I look for great men and that they have some coaching. And then I'm going to tell you, if they're great men and then they could coach, you, you push them in the, in the direction of the culture of the program that, that we go with at Gretna East and then you're going to get great coaches. Yeah. So let me ask you this, because there's a lot of head coaches watching this, and they've got to hire you know, their staff. How do you dig down in the interview process when you start thinking about someone? How do you specifically dig down to say, I want this high-character person? What are you looking for? Are you looking for the things they've done in the past, the things they say in an interview? What do you look for? Well, I'll tell you, that might be the toughest thing for a new head coach right. is the hiring process. For one, I'm a friendly person. I love talking. Uh, so it's really one of those things you got to find somebody that you're going to find out who they truly are. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the toughest, one of the toughest things I had to do this last year was simply uh, let a coach go. Um, you know, we, we coach one year together. He's a great, he's a great man, great person. Um, just didn't match up philosophy with us and, 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 and some the direction I was taking the program. And so it's tough. Mm-hmm. It truly is. So hiring isn't easy. You got to find the right fit for you and your program. You have to make sure they want to buy in. You know, everybody's looking for a job. They want a job. So they, they see if they're truthful about it. Uh, you know, as it, before we started this interview, I told you when I leave here, I'm going to interview a young man for a freshman position. Right. Um, and, and it's tough. Uh, the, the nice part for me is is I, I hire people. I go out and talk to other coaches, coaches that they used to work for. I, I, I interview. I might spend less time interviewing the person than I do talking to the other coaches that they worked for. Mm-hmm. So that, that's what I try to do. What does the average fan not understand about assistant coaches? What do you think that they yep. maybe have a misconception or they don't maybe really fully understand the impact a coach can make? You know, to as me, an assistant. as an assistant coach, it's the impact they have with your players. Because if that's if that assistant coach is negative or, or down, they could tear your program apart. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, 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 the great coaches, the, the – Sean Blevins is my offensive coordinator. Uh, he was a longtime line coach at Westside and then went to Papio, left Papio, went to Midland, and I pulled him away from Midland College to come be my OC. Um, he's just one of the smartest X's and O's football coach I've ever been around. Mm-hmm. Knows the game so well, but he's such a tremendous man and builds relationships with the kids so well. 
That's what makes the difference. That's what helps make my program great is the relationships he builds with the kids. Um, I believe that's one of my greatest attributes is I work really, really well with the kids. And then when you get other coaches thinking the same way and working the same way, those are the things. Uh, I'm telling you, Sean Blevins can be a head coach in any A, B, C, anywhere he wants in this state, but he doesn't want to be. He wants to be an offensive coordinator, O line coach, and that's what makes him great. Just because they're an assistant coach doesn't mean they, they can't be great head coaches. Some of these men could leave right now and be tremendous head coaches everywhere. It's uh, just maybe that's not the path they want to take in life right, right. now. Right. They like the role that they're at. Well, I'll tell you, you talk about the pinnacle of your career. What I loved about your response to me when I asked you this earlier. It wasn't the state championship in 2020 that was the pinnacle, but it was the state championship with all your players and particularly two players that you know yeah. pretty well, yeah. your two sons. Uh, in fact, to quote you, you said it was an amazing experience. Share that. Let us in a little bit about what that was like. Um, boy, it's it's as a coach, you always want to win a state championship. That's the goal is to win a state championship. You know, our our at Gretna East, our, our program is to lead, lead men to be champions on and off the field, mm-hmm. on and off the field. Well, I, I, that's something that I brought from Westside with me. Uh, working with Coach Frank, we built that philosophy, and I, I carried that over to the win to be champions on and off the field. And to be able to be a champion on the field with my two sons, was it's the pinnacle. That That is truth, truthfully. You know, I, I started thinking that was a tough question for me, and I go, boy, you know, Getting named to head coach of Gretna East of a brand new program was pretty dang special, and I and I was so blessed for the opportunity. But just winning that state championship and standing there holding that that trophy, and having both my sons that were major factors in the game, yeah. uh, be standing right next to me was so special. Yeah, you know Barry Kitchell, um, we just met. He works here, of course, as well. And one of the things he said to me is he has that memory of the TV camera of you and your boys. And he said, you know, of course, being a parent himself of five boys who all love football, he just said that was for him a really poignant moment. So I can only imagine what was going through, yeah. you know, your 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 mind at that time. Uh, and I, just, again, that's something you guys are going to hold forever, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, to this day, um, I have that picture hanging in my office at Gretna East, me and my, my two sons holding the state championship trophy side by side with the scoreboard behind us all lit up. Um, just such a special special moment yeah it it, it it sounds like it and I, I think we can all appreciate why that specifically is the pinnacle um you know you also experienced kind of a polar opposite uh, yeah. experience as well that that's the high point but you were interested in being the head coach there at Absolutely. Omaha West Side and, and you shared with me that that was hard it was hard when yeah. you didn't get selected after 21 years getting a lot of blood sweat and tears to it uh, but you didn't get the position. I want to ask you two questions. One, when you heard that announcement that it wasn't going to be you, walk me through that initial what's going through. And I want to, I kind of want to hear where we're at today, which you, you gave me a great quote of how you're feeling today. But what was that initial uh, reaction for you? Heartbreak. Heartbreak. And then it's, we me, we moved our, we, we lived in Blair. We loved Blair. Great community. Raised our kids there. Uh, our, my oldest son, Cade, decided to come to Westside to play for dad. Uh, we moved our family into the district thinking that I you know, had, would have an opportunity to be the next guy. Um, so you move up, up your family and your boys and you, and you move somewhere. Um, you know, houses in the Westside district aren't cheap. And I wanted to make sure I was in the district uh, so I could be the, you know, show everybody I was dedicated to be the next guy. Uh, my work ethic, um, you know, I, I tried my best. Uh, and then to be passed up was heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. Um, but like I told you, the good Lord works in mysterious ways. Um, as much as that hurt me and and and, and hurt my family and and get passed over, um, you know, six nine months later, um, I, I received a phone call uh, from from the new athletic director of Gretna East High School asking me to apply for the head coaching job. And and looking back now. Uh, I don't know if I would have wanted it any other way Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, to be able to, I'm not following anybody's footsteps. I'm building the culture the way I want to, you know, I get to build this program the way I want to. It's just such a special, special place to be right now. Uh, The administration of Gretna community schools has been amazing. The support amongst the community has been amazing. Um, Yeah. It's, 
Tough. Well, I loved your quote. You said to me, and I wrote it down. You wouldn't trade where you're at for where you're at now for anything. You wouldn't trade no. where you're at now for anything. Nothing. So it, it, you know, after that initial heartbreak. But look, as a coach, you talk to your players all the time about adversity, right? Yep. Has that made you a better coach? And 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 can you relate now to the players in some ways that maybe you know a few years back you you might not have been able to go to when it comes to adversity? Absolutely. And, you know, and adversity comes you know comes and goes in, in all aspects in life. Uh, we might see adversity as, as a little tougher um, for certain situations or not certain situations. Uh, to me, I thought that was the biggest adversity. I, I was I was shook from it to the core. Like, oh, I can't believe that I didn't get this. You know, I, I was crushed, and I was still currently the head boys track coach at the time. Mm, mm. You know, and I had to turn around and get a, a team ready to perform in season. And and you know. Um, to me, I wasn't going to let that down either. I, I, I didn't want anything to carry over to, to affect that track season. Uh, we had a tremendous track season, finished fourth in the state in Class A with some amazing athletes in Jalen Lloyd and Corey Vaughn and uh-huh. Christian Jones and, and all those guys. And, and, and we had a great season. But at the time, you know, it, was, it, it helped me as a coach to learn that, hey, you have to, you have to deal with the adversity head on. Mm-hmm. Yet you have to put it behind you and move forward, also. And and like I told you, I wouldn't trade this for the world. I love Gretna East. I, you know, my my wife, uh, you know, says, "Boy, you you went head over heels into that yellow and black, didn't you?" <laughs> and <laughs> hey, Kurt, you even got the yellow and black yeah, shoes on the today. They got, there we go. On. Yeah, I don't know if Tanner got that. But yeah. yeah, I you know that's that, that's. I, I love the people out there. I love the community. I have an amazing support system with the Booster Club, um, that with the administration, with my athletic director Ryan Garter. Uh, Chad Jepson, former uh, Gretna head football coach, is, is our, our building principal. Uh, the, the people, the stat, it's just amazing. I, it's, I'm building a program the way that I see that it's, it's best, and then and we're going to do our best to, to make some runs to try, to try to get to the state championship for these boys. Yeah, you've got a blank canvas. Now, it's, it's got some color on it now because you're going yep. into year two, but when you went in completely blank, what was the – I mean, here you are, you were – Many coaches watching this show have gone into a program as the new head coach, but a lot is there, right? The infrastructure infrastructure is there. You walk in literally with a blank canvas. So what is the number one priority when you think back to it that you said, I've got to get this done first? How did you prioritize that? Uh, it was a cult- cultural roadmap. That's something I learned under Coach Freund. That's something Coach Freund brought to our program, and we had to find out what the important values of our program were. And, and we talked about loyalty. We talked about character of our players and our coaches. We talked about pride of the school. Um, we, we just went through and built this cultural roadmap. When I hired my staff, I went after the, the people that I thought highly of as, as there were coaches within in the state, um, and I went after them. And I was so blessed to have uh, Mr. Jepson say, um, we'll hire them as coaches, but if they're great teachers, we'll hire them as teachers also. Mm-hmm. Uh, these are the spots I have open. Let's see if we can find them. And, and we went through, we worked together. He, he made some coaching contacts for me. I made some coaching contacts and, uh, they let me hire my staff. And then once I hired that staff, priority number one was to build that cultural roadmap and let the kids know it hangs in our off or in our locker rooms. Uh, the kids know it, uh, it's week one of summer, uh, week two of summer, we're going to start implementing those things. So the freshmen get to know them. Our unity council leads it. I have created a unity council within our team that, you know, we copied from Coach Osborne down Lincoln. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do everything uh, to try to really build the culture of this program and, and help build these young men to be champions on and off the field. Off the field might be bigger than on the field. Yeah. You know, because uh, today there's a lot of things in, in society, social media and all these things. And we got it. You know, they have amazing parents and great parents. But if we can help supplement and, and, and reinforce some of those things within the program, it's going to help. Yeah. So how do you do that, Coach? I mean, at, at day one, you've got to start – you've got to build it again from the ground up, the culture. Yep. Did you get players involved? Did you develop your staff and then bring them in and get involved? Or was it stuff that you would just learn that said, this is you know, this going to be my program, so we've got to really develop the culture the way I see it? Nope. How did you develop that cultural roadmap? Yeah, you know, to be honest with you, when I got hired – First thing I did is I called Coach Freund. I went back to Coach and I said, Coach, I'm going to use some of this. And he helped guide me. This is how we started building it. And he kind of gave me gave me the roadmap. And I hired the staff and we sat down as a staff. And, and, and uh, 
Chris Kelsey is on my staff, and mm-hmm. and, and and he had a meeting spot. We uh, met at the Lost Rail, and we shut our ourselves in, into one of their private offices. And, By the way, if you need me to join you at the Lost Rail sometime, oh. just call. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Good meeting spot. It, it was a great meeting <laughs> spot. And it was in the winter and we set, we shut ourselves in the, in the, in a private little room of, of eight, a round table of eight chairs and I had the eight coaches and, and we went to work and um, there was tough conversations of what should be in that cultural roadmap and what should it. And, and we, we sat down and we, we hashed it all out. And uh, at the end of it, we said, are we all going to live by this? And they said, yep. And then that's how we started mm-hmm. now going into year two, Right. Once we get the UC going um, for the the new UC, then we'll sit down and we'll re- readjust that cultural roadmap to meet the needs of this team. And that's important that you, you, that we go ahead and readjust that to meet the needs of every team. They might look and say, hey, coach, you know, when we talk about BAM, BAM is one of our, our catchphrases, BAM, be a man. You know, we talk about person to person. Uh, we don't talk behind each other's back, you know, not as coaches, not as players, not – we talk man to man, P to P, person to person. And so they might sit down and say, hey, Coach, we don't need P2P. Everybody does P2P right now. So maybe we eliminate that and put something that is, that's needed. The kids will have a say in what the cultural roadmap is. But once it's set, it's set in stone. I like it. So when you look back on it, what was one thing that came up that you're like, I had no idea? I mean, listen, you can go in, you can be as prepared as you want. But when you were starting a, a program from nothing, right, yes. from scratch, what hit you that you're like, I didn't even think of this? Well, I'll tell you the ordering is is, is, is <laughs> of anything. Yes, uh, and, and I was truly blessed. I had a high school former high school head coach help yeah. order, and Chad Jepson, and and they did a really tremendous job. But when you outfit 120 kids, 130 kids with helmets, mm-hmm. you you go order 150 helmets. Well, it's not nearly enough. Well, we just were coming out of pandemics and shipping shortages and stuff locked in containers. Well, we didn't have enough helmets. We didn't have the for day one of helmets. We didn't have enough helmets. I had to call over to, to Coach Kale at Gretna High and, hey, Coach Kale, you know it's great. You know, great talk to you. Is there any chance I can get like ten, fifteen white helmets? We wear black helmets. They wear white ones. But Coach Kale was amazing, and and he was a, a nice guy to to work with. Um, and then he called up. He said, "Whatever you need, Coach." And, and he got us the helmets we needed until we got our, our shipments in. But it, the, the, the ordering has been, it's been a learning experience, if anything. I can only imagine. I got to imagine there's probably days where you just walk in, you're like, you know, it's not there, right? Because a yes. program's got kind of everything. It may be yeah. outdated. But in your case, there's probably times where there's just not things there, yes. right? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, think about like, you need all the, the huddle stuff, the sideline, right. you know, the sideline power stuff. The, there we the, go. The, the headsets, you know, <laughs> you, we had to order all of it. You don't, you don't think yeah. of those things. And, and so just getting all the ordering from, we were sitting around like two weeks before we had our, our team camp. And I'm like, I, I haven't seen a mouthpiece yet. I better look. We didn't order mouthpieces. <laughs> so just scrambling to, to do all those things. And, and it's been tons of fun. And, and still we just ordered, we, uh, had to order some more uniforms. We didn't have enough uniforms that, to add a freshman staff, and so we ordered uniforms. I went through that process, and 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 you get just learning all those how to write the POs for a new school district and doing all the things that, that, that Gretna did that I wasn't used to. And it's been just, a, but they're been so amazing. But there's been so many people out there that are willing to help and teach and learn. Yeah, so. I mean, with a great example, Coach Kale. I mean, uh, a rival down the road, and yes. yet uh, right there for you. And by the way, I need to credit a couple of students here. I got so much research out of the articles done at Gretna East oh, yeah. and at Westside. Some great stories they wrote. But one of the things I read in one of the articles is that you have never taken a one, one-step one approach, right? There's only one way to approach a student to connect. Yep. You've always believed that you have to kind of meet the student where they're at yes. is, is, is how I'm going to kind of phrase this. Where did that come from and why is that important to you in connecting? <laughs> well... Um, I grew up and, um, I struggled with dyslexia. I really did. Uh, and then school wasn't easy for me. And the teachers that only attacked it at one approach is the ones I struggled with. Mm-hmm. And, and the teachers that would willing to bend and find and help and learn and, and find different ways. Now, you know, to me, it was amazing. I, I, I would love to know more about the human brain. When I retire, I promise you, I'll be doing some studying on how the human brain truly works. Um, I struggled with dyslexia horribly until I hit like 22. And then it's like it disappeared for me. 
I struggle to read. I read out loud every day in school. I read books. I do so much. And, and I learned I had to find different ways to adapt to be successful mm -hmm. in life. Well, you have to do the same thing for a kid. Not every kid learns the same. You learn different than I, I learn. We learn different than they learn. And you have to find ways to meet the needs of every kid. If you don't, if, if you're not a true educator, I'm going to tell you, football is my second job. Being an educator is my first job. That's the most important thing to me. Mm -hmm. That's the one that pays the bills. The football is what I love to do. I love teaching even more. That it's so important that if you can find a way to connect with a kid and help him find a way to be successful in life and not be on the gridiron or just help him be successful in life and all aspects of life, that's teaching. That's not the sports are the fun part, yeah. you know, and, and the best part is a kid like me in high school. Sports is what kept me going to school every day. You know, I didn't like school. It was hard. Yeah. But I had to go do it because I, so I could play football and run track and basketball and soccer and all those things. Um, so those were the avenues that I, I, I try to take with my students, find ways to meet the needs of every student to help every student be successful, no matter who, where they're from, what their socioeconomical backgrounds are. Everybody has uh, hardships in life. And, par you know, kids are going through so much today. You know, back in the day, we did something stupid. And it, it, it just stayed, oh, your friends laughed and it was over. Well, now it goes on social media and thousands of people see it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many tough things that kids have to deal with that we didn't have to. So you have to find ways to help every kid be successful in life, yeah. no matter what's going on. And by the way, speaking about one of those articles, it was actually a student who talked about, uh, you know, how, how great you were as a teacher. It wasn't one of your players, which I think also speaks to your emphasis, of course, of being an educator first, which, which says a lot about you, but well said. Coach, we have gotten kind of deep here today. Yes. Now we're going to have some fun. Okay. We're going to do a little thing we call three and out. Okay. So it's first and ten. So uh, these questions are a little bit out there, a little uh, yeah. out on the fringes, but we'll have some fun with it. First question, since you got all those red cards and you got kicked out of soccer <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> back in your day, which we didn't even talk about. No. But not surprised, middle linebacker playing a little soccer. Yeah. So here's the thing. What sport has the most amount of flops? Diving? Soccer or basketball? NBA basketball, hands down. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, boy, going back from a Larry Bird and Jordan, those guys played the game, to what's being played now, boy, Jordan, those guys would have scored 120, 150 50 a game if they played in today's league. Yeah. i tell you what, I have a feeling that you might have been kind of the enforcer in the basketball. <laughs> when you played a little basketball in high school, were you kind of yes. the enforcer on the court? On my job, I, I was Dennis Rodman. Uh, that's <laughs> how I tell people I, I would – I couldn't shoot to save my life, but I could rebound and and, and, and enforce, make sure no, nobody messed around with Brian Stackhouse. <laughs> yeah, like, they left Brian alone. That's right. I yeah. love it. every team needs that guy. I got to tell you. All right, question two. We got second down and seven. Uh, you are now back in college, yes. and you just got signed on to play at Nebraska. Yes. And you get to pick your NIL deal. What is your NIL deal? I'm a California kid, and I love Mexican food. Oh, I'm I thought we were going sushi. Hey, I'm signing Javi's Tacos right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm signing a Javi Taco NIL deal. I love it. What kind yeah. of taco, though? Oh, it, corne asada. You got to go with the steak. You got to go with the steak tacos. It's absolutely amazing. I love it. You got some protein going on there. I like that. So I asked the last coach uh, last week that interviewed, if you get a day, uh, they give you a day that you can go shadow any coach. It could be yeah. past or present. It could be any sport, but you could go spend one full day to watch this coach work. Who would that coach be? Boy, there's so many amazing coaches. And and I'll tell you, uh, having a son getting recruited all over the country and, uh, you know, there's amazing coaches. And, you know, uh, here in the state of Nebraska, how do you not say Coach Osborne? You know, what an amazing coach. And he, yeah. he's been amazing. You know, Coach Rule's doing amazing things down at Lincoln right now. I'd love, love to sit and chat with him. Um, Coach Hammock at Northern Illinois. I'll, I'll tell you, th there's a coach. I, I don't know if he's gonna be there very long. He is a tremendous man. And, and but if I if I want to sit down, some playing there. Too, yes, yeah. absolutely. And but I will tell you, the coach that I would love to just sit down and just really, really pick his brain is um, boy, it's such a. There's so many I would love to. I, I think I'd have to go to the University of Iowa. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I really, really would. Uh, you know, that whole coaching staff, 
they're, they're amazing. They really are. The way they, they recruit the state of Nebraska, uh, the way they uh, you know recruited my son, um, I would love to sit down with that whole coaching staff. It wouldn't be just, you know, just the head guy. Um, LeVar Wood, the recruiting coordinator, is just a tremendous, tremendous man. Uh, he's going to be a head coach somewhere soon. Uh, but I would love just that whole staff. I'd love to sit down and pick their brain. I know the the Nebraska fans are booing me right now. Um, I'm not a you know I, I love Nebraska. I love the like I said. I'd love to go down and 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 sit down with Coach Rule. Mm-hmm. Coach Rule's made himself so available to us as high school coaches here in the state. He's amazing. I will at some point, uh, you know, do my best to get down there. Um, but there, there's a lot you can learn from every coach. Yeah, and, but coach, I'm, and I interrupted you here. Finish yeah, that. No, no, go, go, go. Well, I'm not surprised. Look, you love your your defensive guy, the kind of defense, the brand of defense that the Hawkeyes have played. Yes. I'm a I listen. I'm season ticket holder, Nebraska. Listen, I I don't like losing to the Hawks, but they play a physical. I mean, their defense has been outstanding, and I imagine yeah. that's part of what is an, an allure to you for them. Absolutely, it is. I mean, but their their program. You know their offense hasn't been great the last few years, and, and you know that's kind, co- coach. That's kind, you know, coach. Yeah, well, <laughs> coach. For you know, Ferentz has done just a tremendous job with the program, but Kurt Ferentz is an amazing recruiter. Yeah. I'll never forget uh, when w- my son was being recruited, and they loved him, and um, Kay lost his junior year in the state championship, and the next weekend we went down for a recruiting trip over to Iowa. They they invited him down, big recruiting fair, the whole Hawks. Field house is full of people. We walk in, and there's a line of kids waiting to shake Coach Ferentz's hand. And we walk in, and he stops. Ask everybody to hold a second. He comes over and pulls Kate off to the side. Mm. And tells Kate a whole story about how his son, senior year, lost the state championship, wrestling state championship, and how he drove all the way home with his son in the back seat. Yeah. That connection piece that he made with my son and knowing – he wasn't he wasn't an offered athlete yet and it wasn't signed in any of that but he took the time to build that relationship with him mm. such a special coach um, and then to see how the things he handles situations and, and deals with things and the amazing opportunities that he gives his assistant coaches just a lot to learn as, as a young head coach to from a veteran head coach I'd love to just sit and pick his brain and see where everything goes yeah it's a good one and you got your yellow on today yeah too, yellow and black exactly <laughs> well I can tell you this. Gretna East is in great shape. They made the right hire. Uh, you are, I can't wait to watch the program. That program is just going to grow and grow. Uh, loved what you had to say today, and thanks for spending the time with us. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate everything you do for the sport and, and for, for this interview. And if I ever do anything to help you guys out, please let me know. You got it. Thanks, Coach. Thanks. You bet.